Thank you for coming out tonight to hear about the museum's library. Did everyone know that the museum had a library? Did you know that we're one of the largest and finest libraries of our kind in the world? The monogram you see on the screen is one of the earliest symbols of the museum. It was used on printed tickets and invitations in the first decades of the museum's existence. And if you look closely, you can see the museum's initials, A, M, N, H. And it's good that I'm putting this up because I may refer to the museum as AMNH rather than the American Museum of Natural History. So this is the museum's sesquicentennial year, which is another way of saying we're 150 years old. We were founded in 1869 and our charter states that we were founded as a museum and library. The library collections have been growing and diversifying over these last 15 decades. We have about 550,000 volumes, and we add over 1,000 printed volumes each year. We used to add more before we went electronic. We subscribe to electronic journals to support our scientists' work, and we make these resources available for library visitors as well. Our oldest book dates to 1490, and we have extensive rare book collections numbering 15,000 volumes. What makes our collection additionally exceptional, if that's possible, are the library's non-print collections. These include photographs, film, archival materials, manuscripts, art, and museum memorabilia. In general, these collections grow from internal transfers from other museum departments. All of the projects I'm gonna discuss with you tonight um, have a free online presence on the library's website. Um, so I encourage you to visit. Um, I'm gonna dive in and talk about one of the ongoing projects in the library. The Darwin Manuscript Project digitizes handwritten pages of Darwin's scientific writings, transcribes the text, and creates a new edition of the text, annotated with symbols, endeavoring to explain why certain words or phrases were changed, moved, or deleted. Ultimately, the project staff presents the digitized images and annotations on a public-facing website, freely accessible to all users. And on the left side of the screen here, you can see the digitized image of one of the pages from On the Origin of Species. That's one of the manuscript pages. That also happens to be in the museum's collections. And then on the right side is the transcription. This library-based effort has been successful receiving funding from private and federal grants and is led by a historian of science and Darwin scholar. The effort has completed work on National Endowment for the Humanities and National Science Foundation funded efforts to digitize and transcribe, so far, 36,000 pages of scientific manuscripts. <clears throat> and will soon seek funding to complete their work on the last large body of Darwin manuscripts that include Darwin's field notes from the Beagle, Beagle specimen catalogs, and other diaries and geology notes. Part of Darwin's process was to write short notes on multiple topics on a single sheet of paper, and then when he ran out of space, he would cut or tear the sheets apart and then file the individual notes um, by subject with other little fragments on the same topic. And then when he wanted to write about that topic, he could take out that folder and he'd have all these ideas or citations he could begin to craft into something else. Thousands of these fragmentary notes survive, but it's never been known which notes were originally written together on the same sheet of paper. The library's 2016 Hack the Stacks Hackathon event featured a challenge to piece together these fragments. Volunteer developers created a proof of concept solution, an algorithm that examined the cut or torn edges of these fragments to suggest matches. And today, the Darwin Manuscript Project has been able to virtually reunite a dozen of these sheets that previously had no connection, shining new light on the process of Darwin's work. In commemoration of the museum's 150th anniversary, the library launched a collection of over 3,000 images documenting the museum's historic halls or permanent exhibits. A browse through these images will undoubtedly turn up some surprises, even for the most ardent fan of the museum. Some of these halls featured still persist, while others we might term extinct. 
For instance, who knew we had an oil geology hall in the 50s and 60s? We also provide a list of halls, and by searching on the Hall of Public Health, we can see images of the hall itself, as well as images of components of that exhibition hall, including these wonderful models of insects, flies, and mosquitoes. We're going to take a big jump <laughs> from the library to the Shippy Johnson Peruvian expedition of 1931. Um, one collection among our many photographic collections is the Shippy Johnson Photographic Collection. This documents a pioneering aerial photographic surveying expedition to Peru in 1931 by geologist Robert Shippey and Navy pilot George Johnson. These guys literally cut a hole into the belly of their plane and stuck a large format camera on top that produced 8 by 10 inch negatives. For those of you unfamiliar with traditional photographic negatives, 8 by 10 is massive and about the largest format that can be used in the field. About 3,600 photographs were produced, mostly aerials, but also images depicting people, architecture, and ruins seen from the ground. The aerial images document settlements, land use, archaeological sites, ruins, physical features, glaciers, volcanoes, and unusual landforms. The production of these overlapping large format images were a technical feat of the era when other pi pioneering aviators were just beginning to employ aerial surveys to document and discover archaeological sites. The incidental inclusion of glaciers make these historic views extremely valuable to scientists today. Preservation of these negatives is challenging as they were made on now fragile and potentially combustible nitrate-based film. We're scanning these 8 by 10 inch negatives at 1700 DPI, resulting in extremely detail-rich 230 megabyte files for each negative. These images document a landscape that has been greatly altered in the interceding 90 years by a variety of human activities, but also by natural forces such as landslides, erosion, and earthquakes. There's been a great research interest in these images from several directions, including a geologist studying glaciers, an archaeologist, Steve Warnke from Vanderbilt University, who's responsible for this animation we're about to see, made from the Shippy Johnson images exclusively. So these interested parties have supported our digitization efforts, and we're in the midst of scanning more. Our goal is to make the resulting digitized images available to additional interested researchers. This summer, Teams in planes and drones worked above Peru to create updates of these baseline 1931 images. Just another example of the long reach of our collections. So this is an animation made from, two animations we're gonna see, made from only a small number of images um, from the Shippy Johnson collection. Just to give you an idea of how rich these overlapping large format um, 1931 negatives are. These glaciers don't exist there anymore, and some of these ruins in the Colca Valley may not appear as they did almost 90 years ago. Massachusetts-born Nicholas Pike was the U.S. consul to Mauritius from 1866 to 1872, where he made extensive collections of Indian Ocean fishes and collaborated with local artists to document his discoveries. His important work was a milestone in the early study of natural history of these islands east of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. Mauritius was also home to the ill-fated dodo bird, just to give you some context historically. Curiously, the zoological specimens Pike collected found their way to Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology, while the volumes of his paintings and notes relating to those same specimens were acquired by then AMNH trustee J.P. Morgan and later given to the museum's library. Keep your eye on the little right guy in the upper right corner because he's going to come back on a future slide. The eight volumes of paintings, drawings, and manuscript notes survived all this time but were in extremely rough condition, presenting numerous conservation challenges. Renewed recent interest in Pike and serendipitous funding from a friend of the library supported the Library Conservation Laboratory's treatment of the largest and most endangered volume of this group. Here you can see it before treatment, and here's what it looks like now. 
Our expert conservators work to ensure the integrity of the notes and art. And after treatment, the individual pages were encapsulated in mylar, um, matted and rehoused. We were also able to digitize the album pages and make them accessible online through our image portal, Digital Special Collections. Thanks to continued support, conservation work on additional Pike volumes continues. Research interest in these volumes arose as the Royal Society of Arts and Sciences of Mauritius began preparations for celebrating the bicentennial of Pike's birth. The Mauritian festivities commemorating Pike's birth, Pike's birth included an exhibit featuring reproductions of many of the album's pages and an academic symposium on Pike's work. Mauritius also issued a postage stamp with an image from one of the museum's albums depicting the once common local damselfish Pomacentris pikei, the one you saw on the earlier slide. In 1926, AM&H artist William Robinson Lay traveled to East Africa with taxidermist and artist Carl Akeley to document environments to be depicted in what is now the Akeley Hall of African Mammals. Lay produced this six-foot wide study for the background of the African wild dog group in 1927. When a dozen paintings and objects from the library were requested for a loan to a contemporary art exhibit traveling to Paris and Frankfurt, it became clear that years of hanging in smoky offices here at the museum had given this painting an unnaturally dark nicotine hue. Uh, we were fortunate that a foundation interested in art conservation happened to call and offer to generously support a thorough cleaning before the painting and the others left on their European tour, looking pretty pristine. In conclusion, this is an extremely exciting period for the library, and I am very, very, very fortunate to have dedicated, creative colleagues with wonderfully complementary talents who are all up to the challenge of continuing the library's proud and long traditions of supporting our researchers and increasing access to our diverse and important collections. Thank you.